All right, so in this video, we want to start exploring the idea of projectile motion. Now, projectile motion is any time an object is launched into the air, um, and the only influence uh, that it experiences is that of gravity. Now, we're going to ignore air resistance for the moment. In truth, everything is subjected to air resistance, but in the cases that we're going to consider, we're going to assume that air resistance is mostly negligible, and for a lot of different situations, that's actually not a very bad approximation. So, to start, we're gonna look at this first problem here. So we're gonna suppose that we launch an object uh, straight up, and the object has a mass m, and it's launched upward with an initial velocity vi, and we want to know two things. These are the two most natural questions to ask if we're given these initial conditions of the speed that it is launched with. Um, actually, that's really the only piece of information we'll need to know. As we'll see, the mass is actually what we call a red herring. We actually don't need to know anything about the mass. Um, you might think that the heavier the object, the, that might make a difference in its path, but as long as air resistance is negligible, then the mass can actually be removed from the calculation and the uh, path is independent of the mass, okay? So as far as projectile motion goes that we're going to consider, uh, for most of our cases, we only need to know the initial velocity vi. Now this is specific to the situation where the object is launched upward, okay? Straight upward. We will talk about the situation where we launch something at an angle, okay? Something like maybe a golf ball. But uh, in this particular case, we're just launching it straight up and letting it come straight back down. Now, the two most important equations that we're going to need are the first of the two, um, the first two of the kinematic equations, okay? Now, uh, there's one thing that we have to do, all right? There's one thing that we have to do. I've already drawn my diagram, but we have to pick a coordinate system uh, with which to work, okay? Um, in our case here, it's probably most natural to assume that upward is in the positive direction and downward is in the negative direction. I cannot stress this enough. When you're problem solving these types of word problems, you will be able to save yourself a lot of headache if you first draw a diagram and then define your coordinate system, okay? Those are the first steps <coughs> you should um, use, okay? Now, first things first, let's solve for the total time, all right? What, what's the total time the object is gonna be in the air? Now, there's a few different things that we can do. I like to first list out the variables that we are given, okay? Now, first things, we, we are given that the mass is m. Now, I've already told you that we won't necessarily need that, that that's a red herring, but you may not know that ahead of time when you're working through these problems on your own. It may be a little bit difficult to pick out what you actually do need and what information might be uh, superfluous or not necessary. Uh, we're given the initial velocity as vi. And there's one piece of implicit information that we have to assume, and that is that our acceleration is uh, g, negative uh, 9.8 meters per second. Okay. So I'm gonna, don't let these double dashes confuse you. This is the dash just like these are, and this is the negative sign attached to the g. Okay, now, we know that my object is going to slow down on the way up, okay? How do we know that? Well, that's just from common sense experience, right? If I toss my pen up in the air, it goes up, but as it's moving upward, it's going to slow down. Why is it going to slow down? because gravity is always pulling it downward, okay? Gravity is always going to be acting toward the ground. That's why our gravity is negative in this case. We define upward to be positive, downward is toward the ground, and downward is always going to be the direction that gravity acts, okay? Now, time can never be negative. So you might ask yourself, what happens if we flip-flop these coordinates and say, okay, I'm gonna make 
upward negative and downward positive. In fact, you would get the same answer, okay? Time cannot be negative, and since uh, our equations have to be coordinate system independent, there are reasons why they have to be coordinate system independent, uh, but because they're coordinate system independent, then it does not matter as far as the uh, time goes what your um, total time will be, okay? You will get the same answer either way, right? So we've listed our given information. Now how can we actually find the total time, okay? How can we find the total time? Well, it turns out that we have to employ a, a little trick, okay? So consider the motion of my pen, right? Consider the motion of my pen. What's happening as the pen is rising and then it reaches the top of its peak before it starts to fall back down, okay? Think about that point. If I'm moving this direction, and then all of a sudden I'm moving this direction, that means there has to be a point at which I'm not moving either up or down, and that's the turning point, okay? And that means that at the turning point, my velocity is zero, and that happens at the peak, okay? So in the vertical direction, the velocity will be zero. So here's what I can do, all right? I'm going to erase these and I'll just summarize them here. Okay, so we know our mass, our initial velocity, and gravity is negative. And at this point up here, I know that my velocity is going to be equal to zero. Okay, at the peak, my velocity is gonna be equal to zero. And maybe, maybe I should write that a little bit bigger. Maybe we'll even give it the subscript peak. Okay, so my velocity at my peak must be zero because that's the point at which the object turns around, okay? So what that means is I can find the time from the point of launch to the peak using the first kinematic equation, okay? And the motion will also be symmetric, and we would be able to convince ourselves of that uh, by also using the kinematic equations, but if you're willing, at least for the moment, to accept that it will take just as long for it to fall back down as it does for it to rise up, okay? And if you think about it, it should make sense because I'm accelerating at the same rate downward, right? I'm constantly accelerating downward, so whatever velocity I launch up with, it's going to take the same amount of time to reach the peak as it does to then fall back down, okay? Um, and so what we can do is use this first uh, kinematic equation, and we can say, okay, if I let my final velocity be represented by the peak, then at that point the velocity must be zero. And so I can say, zero is equal to vi plus negative g t, and I'm gonna put a one half here, okay? And that means that t is one half of the flight time, okay? So the t time at the peak, okay? If, if we let this be v peak, which equals zero, the velocity at the peak, my time will be one half of the total flight. Okay, so that's what this t one half means. And so I can solve this equation for my flight time, and t, okay, let's move negative g t one half over to this side, and that will make this positive. And we see that half of the flight time is given by the initial velocity divided by gravity. Now, before we go any further, let's make sure that our units work out, okay? And so, velocity is meters per second, and, and, and let's, do length, let's do length over time, and acceleration is length 
per time squared, okay? And we have a complex fraction here, right? We have length over time over length over time squared. And so what this will turn into, length over time divided by length over time squared is the same thing as length over time times time squared over length, right? If I have a complex fraction, I can divide the first fraction by the second fraction and when I do that, I'm multiplying the first fraction by the reciprocal of the second fraction. And we can see that the lengths cancel out. This time will cancel with one of those times. And I'm left with the units of time. So velocity divided by acceleration will give me units of time, in this case, seconds. Okay. So if I want to find the total flight time, how would I do that? Well, if this is half of the flight time, then my total flight time is just twice the velocity divided by the gravity, okay? Divided by the gravitational acceleration. And so uh, that is how you can find the total time of a projectile if you launch it straight upward and you know the speed that you launch it with. Now, what about the maximum height? Well, the maximum height right here, okay, this delta y max, okay, that delta y max can be found from the second kinematic equation. Now, we've derived this, the, the kinematic equations for motion along the x direction, but they're completely uh, symmetric with the y direction as well, okay? So there's no difference uh, in the directions of motion. And so we can use the second kinematic equation, but because we're looking for the maximum height, we have to use one half of the time interval for our time here, okay? We have to use one half of our time interval for our time there, as well as here, okay? So. Let's write the first answer here. One half of the flight time was VI over G, and T total was 2VI over G. And now our delta Y max, this represents the maximum displacement from the ground up to the uh, peak here, okay, is going to be given by VIT one half minus one half g t one half squared. And again, the minus sign here comes from the fact that we're defining gravity to be negative. So when I plug my gravitational acceleration in for a, I have to include the minus sign, OK? So that's where that comes from. And now we can plug this expression in. So delta y max. is equal to VI times uh, VI over G. Minus 1 half G times VI over G squared. OK? And so this will give us a VI squared over G. I'm going to have a minus. I have vi squared on the top and g squared on the bottom here. But one of my g squareds is going to cancel with this g. And so I'm going to get 1 half vi squared over g for my second term. And notice, okay, so I have vi squared over g minus 1 half vi squared over g. And so this is the same thing as having all of something minus half of something. And the result is just half of that something. So the result of this is just 1 half of vi squared over g. Okay. 
And so our result for our delta y max is equal to vi squared over 2g. Okay? So that is how you can find the total time and uh, the maximum height of the projectile when you know the initial velocity. Next time we'll look at what is the final speed that it hits the ground with. All right.